Today, I'm going to go over everything you need to know to get ready for fishing the Lake Superior tributaries coming up this next weekend. And I'm gonna go over rod and reel and line setups. I'm gonna go over fish location, uh, how to read the river. I'm gonna go over my baits, what I'm using for flies, what I'm using for lures, and uh, you know, kind of the whole strategy that I'm gonna be using to, to target steelhead in the spring here on Lake Superior tributaries. So that season's coming up really soon. Uh, let's get into the gear here. Um, first of all, I'm gonna start off with my rod and reel combo that I'm using. And I do things a little bit different than a lot of guys do on the Brule. I fish with a spinning rod and um, spinning reel. And I'm fishing a lot of flies with this. So you don't need a fly rod to fish flies and be effective on the Brule or any of the other tributaries. Um, this has caught me a lot of steelhead, a lot of browns, uh, you name it. So what I'm using this year is the Okuma SST. Eight foot six. This is uh, medium light action, and it's got a nice uh, parabolic action to it to keep those fish hooked on small hooks. And you want the length in this rod for controlling your drift. You can start it high and move that tip down as the as the line drifts past you, and then at the end of your drift, you're holding that way out here, and you can cover, you know, almost 18 feet uh, with that. So the reel I've got on here. Uh, this is a reel that I've been using a lot lately. This is the Daiwa Regal 2500. Super good drag on this thing. Very, very 100% uh, basically anti-reverse, which I really like. Butter smooth drag. Super reliable for the price. That's what I've been putting on most of my rods lately. And then on there, I've got Sunline Float Line. And that's a good tough line. It casts really well. And uh, if I decide to fish floats, I can use this for that as well. So that's the nice thing about a spinning setup. You can fish it like a fly rod and drift um, and swing. And you can also fish floats with it like a center pin rod. So it's pretty versatile. You can also throw spinners or lures with it. So it's basically an all-purpose setup. Um, now I've got this line on here in high-vis green or chartreuse. And the reason for that is I want to be able to see my line on the drift. I do not want to have clear line on my main line because I won't be able to watch that and see where it's going into the water, where it's you know catching in the river, causing drag. I want to be able to have high visibility on my main line. So this is eight pound test, high vis. And then, um, of course you don't want the steelhead seeing your line. So, on here I also have tied on a six pound fluorocarbon leader, that's Seaguar. Uh, I'm gonna link all this stuff in the description because a lot of this stuff is pretty specific as far as the brand I'm using and the exact model. So I'll link all this stuff for you guys. And then on my main line to my leader, I just have a small barrel swivel there and a split shot ahead of the swivel so it can't slide down my leader. And then it's about 24 inch leader. I like a 24 inch, 18 to 24 inches. I like that that lure to be able to drift in the current super naturally. I'm using Gamakatsu octopus hooks. Gamakatsu, I've not found a hook that's better than that yet. But I am going to be testing some of these zone locks this year. And uh, I tested them a little bit ice fishing. They've got a really unique bend behind the, the uh, barb on them. And they seem really strong. And I like the light wire, so I'm, I'm going to test some of those out this year on steelhead. But my go-to is certainly Gamakatsu. And then on there, I've got my typical yarn fly. That's pretty much it for my, my spinning setup. Uh, and like I said, that's super versatile. I can carry one rod and cover almost every technique without switching rods. All right, so here's my fly rod setup. Uh, I also fish fly rods every now and then. I'm not as good with a fly rod. I'm fairly novice at fly fishing, but I have caught steelhead on this setup. This is a eight weight and I've got nine weight line on here. Actually, I'm a little overweighted on the line and uh, I find I can cast better with that. And I've got just a one X leader on here uh, and then I've got 10 pound tippet. So um, 
my typical fly setup, I'm gonna have some sort of nymph ahead of a uh, yarn fly, and that's gonna be my tandem rig, about 12 to 16 inches apart. And then I'm gonna have a few split shot, just real small split shot ahead of that, kind of spaced out about eight inches apart. And that's gonna help keep those flies down in the current and keep them drifting along the bottom. But that gives the trout kind of two options and that's my basic fly setup. And I'm just swinging those through the current slightly upstream and working them down and watching that line for the twitch or the hang up. And you can also indicator fish with this. So um, I'm using probably thingamabobbers for my indicators on the fly line. But uh, that's if I get really ambitious, I might pull this out if I'm really hammering the fish. And it's a lot of fun to fight them on a fly rod. There's plenty of guys who just stick to the fly rod, um, but I, I just like catching fish and I'm much more confident with the spinning setup. So let's go uh, move to kind of what I'm actually tying on these and when, when I'll use them, what water conditions I'll use them and we'll get into that a little bit as far as lure and bait selection, fly selection. All right, so this is my Brule fly box here. And you can see I've got that thing packed pretty full. But my staples in here are gonna be your basic stone fly imitations. This is one of my favorite ones right here. This is from the Superior Fly Angler. And it's kind of a cross between an X legs and a stone fly nymph. But that's a nice size. I like that size. Um, that's a kind of a beadhead nymph. And then there's other kinds of stonefly imitations in here. You know, I've got some more natural looking ones, some real big ones like that. Almost woolly bugger like with just that, that carapace on the back. Um, those are going to be probably my go to on the bigger flies. And then also another staple is on the other side here which I've got a bunch of is Prince Nymphs. Pretty much beat anything if I'm just looking for a good bite. Um, they're hard to beat and then hare's ears as well. You can see I got a whole stack of those. Those are gonna be my main nymphs. Then, then there's a few X legs in here too, some X leg patterns, rubbers. Like this little guy here, he's got a little kinda orange bead head on him. Uh, but those are another insect imitation that really work well on the brule and that's pretty much all i'm going to use for flies i'm not swinging streamers or anything like that in the spring it's basically just nymph imitations and then of course egg imitations i've got some pre-tied ones here but <clears throat> my main staple is the the ones i tie uh, with a snell knot at the river as i'm fishing i just tie a snell knot tuck my yarn in and basically trim it up and go so those I make as I fish. And I'll show you how to tie one of those at the end of this video. Uh, it's really easy, but I do have a few tips to kind of make you more efficient at that. So that's my basic flies, nymphs and egg imitations in the spring. Now you can also tie spawn bags. That's gonna be, you know, a more of a, a live bait or natural bait presentation. Um, they work, they're a lot of hassle. So I only use them typically if I have a lot of good fresh eggs um, or in slower runs, slow water is typically where I'll use those as opposed to faster running water like runs and riffles. I like to use artificials in those spots. So if the river is really slow and low and clear, uh, that's one, one case where I will switch to spawn and I'll just drift it on, on floats real slow through those holes and tend to do better. The other time is if it's really, really muddy and high, sometimes you're better off fishing with a bait that they can smell and getting that scent on there. Um, that's basically the two times I typically use spawn. Otherwise, yarn flies, I just catch a ton of fish on them. They're my go-to steelhead are eating eggs. They're, they're just, that's a staple for steelhead. They're condition to eat eggs and that's what you're imitating with yarn flies so so beads are another excellent choice um, they're also an egg imitation and i've got a few different sizes there for again from the superior fly angler in superior wisconsin and those you're going to peg up above the line just 
up above your hook about two inches um, with either toothpicks like I have here or I've got these little rubber pegs that I really like too. Uh, these are made by um, trout beads and I actually like these better than the toothpicks. But the reason for that is the steelhead will grab that bead and suck it in so deep that if you don't have that thing pegged up above the hook a little bit, <clears throat> you're bound to miss, uh, just get a deep hook and have trouble releasing that fish safely. So that's oftentimes how we rig those beads. I'm not a huge bead guy. I prefer yarn. I've caught fish on beads, but it's not my favorite way to fish. I know some guys that just love it and do really well at it, but like I said, I'm more confident with the yarn. So I bring them with, and if, if guys are smashing them on beads, I'll usually give it a try, but I usually can keep up just fine with, uh, with using yarn. So, And like I said, I'll have this stuff linked. Um, I can link some, some beads too, and the pegs that I like to use from trout beads. So that's kind of my basic setup. I mean, steelhead are not eating big baits in the spring. They're not chasing big spinners down. They're not eating bait fish. So you want to go small, you want to go uh, finesse, and you want to go with eggs and insects. That's your, that's your go-to. So that's kind of what I'm running for rigs. I'll show you how to do that uh, yarn fly here next and give you a few tips on yarn. All right, first off, color. What color do I go with? Obviously, I've been collecting yarn for quite some time. Um, they come in all different shapes. Well, they don't come in all different shapes. They come in one shape. It's yarn, but they come in all different colors. And uh, many of them now are uh, UV, like this one. This is a UV blue. Um, they've got um, kind of glow colors, fluorescent colors. We've got more muted, like peach colors, apricot this is called. And then um, you're, you've even got some chartreuses and some whites. And basically it just comes down to experimentation, uh, what the fish want that day. Sometimes in clear water, they, they want these super bright colors for some reason. It doesn't even necessarily go with water clarity sometimes. You know, I've caught, I've caught fish in dark water on really natural colors, and I've caught fish in really clear water and low water on super bright colors. So sometimes it just depends on the day. Um, now I'll give you a couple tips for getting ready for fishing with this yarn and it's going to help you be more efficient. So let's get down to business. So your basic knot is the Snell knot, which you can see here. And uh, if you go watch the video at the end of this one, I'm, I have it linked to, I'll link it down below as well. But it's the steelhead video I did last spring where I actually show you how to tie that Snell. Uh, it's a pretty basic knot. You can learn to tie it almost anywhere. But the key is that that knot slides up and down the shank. So right now I have it pulled back and you can see it's got a loop in it if we pull it up here. And that's where I'm gonna stick my yarn, right in that loop. So to do that, we've got just a, a, a thread of yarn here and I'm gonna cut about a one inch section off of there like that. That's about what you want. Now, I don't like my yarn flies super big, so I'm actually gonna pull that in half. And that's what I'm gonna use to tie my yarn fly. I'm gonna keep this other half for my next one. And you can mix colors too. You know, you can pull this in half again and put it with a, with a chartreuse and kind of make multicolored yarn too. But for this these purposes, I'm just gonna go with one color. So then we're gonna stick it in that loop right in the middle and then pull it tight slide the knot down and then when you wet that fly it's going to tuck back like that you can just trim the back of it and there's your yarn fly now i try and make this as efficient as i can because i'm tying these out on the river so what i'm going to do is ahead of time before i head out i'm actually going to cut all my yarn into those one inch pieces split them and put them in a baggie so all I gotta do is pick my color, pull it out. I don't have to cut it, I don't have to trim it. I just tuck it in, cinch it up, good to go. And just trim the edge a little bit. I'm always keeping scissors on me on a tether and on my vest or in my sling over bag so that I can trim stuff up and cut line. And that's as simple as it is. Basically bring split shot, hooks, yarn, and you can catch steelhead. So as far as float fishing, I don't do a ton of float fishing, but sometimes to access slower pools 
and get the right drift you do have to add a float and I like to use these clear floats typically they're much more stealthy and they've got that orange top on them so you can see them uh, you can get these pretty much anywhere they sell trout gear uh, this is they make Sheffield makes them um, Raven makes them these are the type that you just slide the two little rubber tubes over your line and then peg this uh, over the top of that and your line at once and that holds it in place but it's easy to move up and down to adjust for different uh, water levels and depths so that's my go-to on floats like I said I don't do a ton of float fishing but sometimes it's really handy to have them just to get the right drift in some of those slower pools and if you have to fish one downstream of you it's also really handy so that's uh, what I'm using for floats all right let's talk nets a little bit um, this is my steelhead net and it could have a deeper pouch this one has about a I think this is a 12 inch pouch on it but it's got a nice big hoop I can fit you know I can fit a 30 inch steelhead in this net um, could it be bigger yes but I've never had too much issue keeping them in here uh, I like the big hoop on it and I like the rubberized mesh so that I'm not hurting that fish and then I've got a short handle on it for waiting I don't need a big long handle on this I'm not in a boat trying to reach down and grab those fish uh, I can probably find this one and leave you a link to this net as well uh, but I've been really happy with this one and it's held up to snagging on the brush five gazillion times so I know it's a tough net too so that's my net um, as far as tackle storage right now I'm just using a, a typical fly fishing vest uh, but I did just order a sling pack that I'm going to be trying this year. I can leave a link for that as well. Uh, I think I'm going to like that one. The vest is just kind of bulky and you got to put it on, zip it up every time. I've seen a lot of guys using the packs and slings and I think I'm going to like that better. So I'll let you know how that goes. But that's kind of my tackle organization storage. Either a vest or a sling pack. And uh, that's basically it. So as far as my waders go good old neoprene cheap neoprene waders is all I've ever used because I am absolutely brutal on waders I put holes in them like all the time I don't know what I would do with a nice pair of waders because they wouldn't last so uh, I do know how to fix these and actually I just got these waders last week and we went out like I said early trout fishing and I already put two dandy holes in this pair I got a, a stick jammed up right in my crotch and poked the hole all the way through here and one all the way through here so they're actually really easy to fix and I'm gonna actually show you how I do it right now it's probably easier than you've ever seen and I'm telling you it works it holds up uh, <laughs> I'll show you right now how I fix my waders because I've fixed them more times than I can count okay guys this is as easy as it gets to fix waders. I've got a hot glue gun. I've got gaping holes in these waders and I've got duct tape on the inside covering up the inside so I don't leak through. I've got my glue gun heated up. I'm gonna squirt hot glue in that crack just like so until it fills it up. I already trimmed the little stringers off the edges of this and then as soon as that's nice and gooped up in there, I'm just going to close that seam like that. Ooze out a little bit around the edges. Press down a little bit. And that baby is sealed back up. So that kind of sums up my gear and what I'm using to catch these steelhead. Now we're going to get into some strategies and how I actually read the river and make my drifts uh, especially with that spinning setup and artificials so we're gonna move to the whiteboard and I'm gonna draw you guys a few uh, illustrations just to show you kind of what I'm looking for and how I want to make that drift to present the bait to the steelhead so let's move over there and then after that hopefully the next video will see you on the brule and we can actually go through some uh, live stuff on the river so it's coming up this weekend opener Hopefully you guys can get out there, but let's move to the whiteboard and talk some strategy. Okay, what I want to go over here is your basic steelhead location. And this is going to be really basic. I'm going to kind of go over location, 
and then how I drift the bait through these locations. And that's pretty much it for this video. Comment below if you guys want to go, me to go into more detail uh, in another video on my, my more in-depth strategy for different lures and kind of how I really break down a river even more. But basically, any river has got a series of what, what I would call pools, tails, which are the tail of the pool, runs, and riffles. Um, now in high water, typically you're gonna find more fish in shallower runs. Uh, in low water, they'll, t they'll oftentimes gather near pools, often near the tail and the head of the pool. And then um, in kind of average flows, they can be found throughout the river. Uh, steelhead are much more tolerant of current than a lot of other trout. So you'll, you will find them in these tails and riffles behind boulders, um, kind of even in that faster water. Um, and that's oftentimes where they spawn is like at the tail of a hole or a run and on gravel riffles. So they'll move out of these pools and runs into those shallow areas uh, when they're actually spawning. But um, probably my favorite spot to fish on regular, regular flow water levels is runs. Uh, oftentimes pools are hard to fish, they're hard to get your bait down to the bottom, uh, and I tend to find more active fish in runs, and you've got more current to kind of push that bait along and keep it in front of the fish. So, uh, but don't be afraid to fish these fast water areas either because they will hold fish at certain times, uh, and they often get overlooked by people who are fishing, looking for these deep holes and just sitting there um, and also, you know, don't just look for like along the river. These, these spots can also occur on either side of the river. So sometimes you might have a riffle on, a, uh, on this side where you might have a run on the other side. Um, so you can split the river in two different directions as well. And, you know, as I work my way down the river, I will fish all these structures, but depending on the flow of the river, if it's really high or low, uh, I'll, I'll spend more time on spots where I think the fish are gonna be holding. So um, on rocks like this, fish will sit right behind a big boulder, but they'll also sit right in front of a big boulder because there's a current break in front of a boulder as well as behind it. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Make sure you fish the front of it and the tail pool behind it. Um, probably, you know, the best strategy for fishing runs is to just throw up to the head of the run, work it down past you, do that drift across the run a few times, move to the next bottom section, and just keep moving down the run in sections like that and break it up if you have room. Sometimes there's guys fishing, you know, the tail, and you'll have to kind of stay towards the head of the pool. But that's my basic strategy for how I break down the river. Okay, so as far as how I'm drifting my lures through, so typically I'm using a spinning rod or a fly rod and I'm casting upstream to the head of this run or pool and I want that, that fly to be, or that lure to be angling upstream and then I'm going to swing it down through the center of the hole and then swing it past me and as it swings around then I'm going to pull it out as it gets to about a 45 degree angle downstream of me. Uh, so then you're covering that whole thing in front of you, like I said, about 18 feet or so that your rod tip can swing. And then it'll be, you know, probably about a, a quarter circle of an angle you're going to be fishing there. And here's the key to fishing artificial lures and like flies and yarn flies on a spinning rod with a weight ahead of them like I do. I'm gonna move to this side. So basically your line is going out from your rod tip. Let's see your rod tip is right here in the middle. When it's going out this direction, it's going into the river and your weight is right here your bait is getting pushed downstream. So your fly is right here. Now when that fish moves in on it, and this is both, both of these are drifting this way. When that bait, that fish moves in and grabs that bait, 
he's going to pick it up and your sinker is what you're going to be feeling and you're just going to feel that sinker rolling along you're not going to feel the bite if you've got if that sinker is falling behind that fly so what you want to do is be slowly pulling that sinker that weight towards you as it comes across in front of you so you get more of a more of a angle like this so you want to keep that weight up with your fly and you don't want it to get too far behind because that way when the fish grabs it it's only a split second and that slack's taken up and you feel the bite right away so i kind of throw a cross stream and then slowly pick, keep my rod tip up as i bring it across to keep that sinker moving with the fly now as it gets out in front of you like right here you want to still be moving that but as it comes around you actually want to slow your rod tip down because that fly is going to naturally start to make its way around and this angle is going to naturally change and by the time you get down here it's going to be pretty much um, right where you want it but you still want that fly moving so you're going to move your rod tip with it as you swing around to keep up with that fly and sinker but as soon as you feel as soon as the fish picks up that fly you're instantly going to have a connection with it as you bring it around and swing it through the tail of that hole um, that's the key to feeling bites if you've got a big angle on here and your sinker's falling behind bouncing along the bottom fish picks it up it's gonna you're just not going to feel it you won't have a clue that that fish hit that bait and you're going to miss your shot so try and always keep that slack uh, taut between your lure and your rod and you're going to feel more bites now as far as the drift goes um, as I drift through a run so this would be the top of the water this would be the bottom I want my weight floating along and just ticking the top of these rocks every three to five feet maybe I don't want to be dragging along these rocks and just bouncing along them it's going to hang up on you and you're going to get snagged on these rocks um, and also it's going to drag on those rocks and slow your fly down which you don't want you want that fly drifting right with the current at the same speed as the current now when your sinker's down here that's this is why i tie a fairly long leader between my sinker and my fly um, the fly is going to be up here so your sinker is down here your fly is up here and as it moves along that fly is just going to drift just above the rocks and right in the fish's face if they're you know sitting tight to the bottom um, that's basically how i'm going to design my weight and pick how much weight i want on my on my bait is how that's ticking along the bottom if it's dragging too much i'm going to lighten up my weight if i'm not touching bottom I'm going to add a little weight until I can just tick it as I pull through and let that swing through the tail of the hole. That's basically it. That's my, you know, my three pointers to you guys as you fish the river. Look for those key areas. Make sure you're not dragging the bottom, but that you're ticking the bottom. And then also make sure that you've got that line as little slack as possible between you and that that bait so you can feel the hit and as soon as you feel that hit set the hook before the fish spits the bait so that's basically how i target these steelhead and uh, in the springtime on all the lake superior tributaries doesn't matter which one you're fishing that's pretty much my go-to setup my go-to tactics um, and certainly there's going to be fish kind of moving in and out of these rivers all season You'll get some fresh ones, the silver ones out of the lake. You'll get some holdovers, and especially in the brule that are more dark colored. But steelhead's a steelhead. They're all gonna bite if you get the right bait in front of them. So just keep fishing and keep trying this stuff and eventually you'll hook up on a steelhead and they are an absolute blast once you hook them. So get out there, get hooked up on the brule. Hope to see you out there. And uh, hopefully my next video will actually be uh, on the river going over some more of this stuff live on the river. So see you next time, guys.